Well, now that we have our minds on the right things, <laughs> let's, let's just go ahead and open our Bibles. This is not even working on uh, Psalm 91. Psalm 91. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, for it is he who delivers you from the snare of the trapper and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you may seek refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a bulwark. You will not be afraid of the terror by night or of the arrow that flies by day, of the pestilence that stalks in darkness, or of the destruction that lays waste at noon. A thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not approach you. You will only look on with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. For you have made the Lord my refuge, even the most high, your dwelling place. No evil will befall you, nor will any plague come near your tent. For he will give his angels charge concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will bear you up in their hands that you do not strike your foot against the stone. You will tread upon the lion and cobra, the young lion and the serpent you will trample down. Because he has loved me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him securely on high because he has known my name. He will call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With a long life, I will satisfy him and let him see my salvation. Let us pray. There's no question that there is evil in this world. Evil is real and unfortunately is all around us. Job, in the book of Job, chapter 1, verses 6 and 7 say, now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? And Satan answered the Lord and said, from roaming about on the earth and walking around it. Then in 1 Peter, in chapter 5, we read, be on the alert, your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. So you see, we are permanently surrounded by danger. And about this, I have to say that humanity craves protection. All of us, we want to protect ourselves. We want to protect our families. We want to protect our possessions. We want protection for our freedom, for the economy, you name it. Protection is something that we crave. All of us desire safety, and we seek it wherever we can. In 1996, Israel completed a protective wall that would separate southern Israel from the Gaza Strip. Then, in 2021, after a billion dollars, that's billion with a B, after a billion dollar upgrade, Israel officials nicknamed it the Iron Wall. As you can imagine, a billion dollar wall is no ordinary wall. This wall was built with deep under, a deep underground layer of concrete that would prevent terrorists from digging tunnels to go under it. This wall raised 20 feet above the ground and it extends for 37 miles. And this barrier was not only just the wall, it was equipped with state-of-the-art surveillance technology that included some things that are straight out from a James Bond movie. So they have these surveillance balloons that are outfitted with 360 view degree cameras. So these are these like meteorological balloons that are hanging high in the air. They were attached to the ground with a metal cable and they're just floating there with cameras that can see all around them. On top of that, this wall has different monitoring stations along the wall where people are watching the cameras and keeping track of the sensors and movements. 
And these surveillance towers, they have cameras that can see people from six miles away. And then to make um, things better, they have weapons towers equipped with remote control 50 caliber machine guns posi positioned every 100 yards along the wall. So if they see a threat, they activate the machine gun and they shoot wherever they need to. So as you can imagine, the Israeli authorities promised that the wall would protect the people of South Israel from any terrorist incursion. They all truly believed that the wall would indeed keep them safe and that the wall would protect them. But it didn't. On October 7, 2023, around 5.15 in the morning, Hamas terrorists began their way to make their way toward the wall from their side of the wall, and they are starting to head to the Iron Wall. And as the terrorists are getting closer to the wall, Hamas unleashes a barrage of thousands of rockets aimed at more than 30 communities near the Israeli side of the wall. So as you can imagine, thousands of, of, of rockets, it's like, like, like the, the, the sky was on fire. And within minutes, more than a thousand evil men broke through the wall in more than 30 locations to commit what would become the deadliest assault in Israel's history. Now by 6.40 a.m., Israel's iron wall had crumbled. More than 1,200 people were killed and 240 were taken hostage. So the billion dollar wall turned out to be fragile, giving Israel a false sense of security. This wall was designed to prevent individuals from crossing. Israel never thought, they never imagined that an, an entire terrorist army would attempt to break through. And then, in the aftermath of the attack, a few months after, Lieutenant Colonel Peter Lerner, who is the spokesman of the Israeli Defense Forces, he said this, and I quote, the barrier itself is a concept that was perceived to be a strong line of defense, but any line of defense can only withhold a certain amount of pressure, end quote. His statement is, is so true for everything that man produces. It's true for everything that man makes. But it is not true for God. And today we're going to see how there is no power in the universe strong enough to break through God's protection. Our psalm today is divided into sections. The first section is composed of an expression of faith in verses 1 and 2. It is followed by some threats of danger in verses 3 through 8. And then there is also a promise of security in verses 9 through 13. Now, in the second section of the psalm, we have verses 14 and 16. And here we have a prophetic oracle in which God declares that he is not merely there physically, not, not physically, he, he's there with his people, but he's not being passive. He's actually protecting them. So let us read verses 1 and 2. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible, where the Hebrew noun set, uh, Seter has been translated as shelter. That's what my Bible says. But if you're reading from the King James, or perhaps the New King James, you will see this noun translated as the secret place. And the reason for this discrepancy in the uh, translation of this noun Seder is because the noun can also mean a hiding place or a covering or a hidden thing or a secret thing. But in, in this particular context, the meaning of this noun is actually, it, it, this is talking about protection from Yahweh. So that is why the NASB and the English Standard also have translated this as the shelter of the Most High, rather than in the secret place of the Most High. And while this may appear like two different translations, in reality, they're not 
They're the same. They both convey the same message because they both describe a place where someone can take cover. They are describing a place to hide. This noun describes a refuge revealed by God to believers and believers only. This is a place that our enemies, regardless of who they are, could not penetrate. Now, I would like to begin by noticing what the psalmist did not say about God in verse 1. The author did not say that this God is high among the high. He's not mighty among the mighty. He is not a Lord amongst other lords or a God among other gods. Instead, the psalmist said that God is the most high, the almighty, the Lord, he is simply God. And this God is the same God who spoke everything into existence back in the book of Genesis. This God is the same God who will speak his enemies into oblivion when John's prophecies in the book of Revelation come to pass. This is the one and only God who said in Isaiah 45, I am the Lord and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. The psalmist knows him. In fact, in verse 2, he lets us know that he not only has a personal relationship with God, but that he has, a, has personally experienced God's protection and provision. Therefore, he calls him my refuge, my fortress, my God. And in him, the psalmist has placed his faith and trust. So what the author wants us to know here is that those who dwell in the shelter of the Most High, meaning those who belong to God, those who have communion with the sovereign God of the universe, will also find safety and protection in him. Throughout history, men have sought protection from danger in many places whether it is caves or tunnels, mountaintops, castles, islands, fortresses, you name it. And today, we have the same thing. Today, we have, for example, in the US, we have nuclear bunkers. Some of them are in use, some of them are not. But one of them is NORAD, the North American Aerospace Defense Command, which is located in the Cheyenne Mountain in Colorado. And this place provides the aerospace warning and protection for Canada and the continental United States. It's deep in the mountains, and it is ready for any kind of nuclear attack. And we also have some uh, mobile fortresses. In this case would be uh, the USS Gener uh, Gerald Ford. It's a Nimitz-class aircraft carrier that is supposedly, supposedly unsinkable due to all the weapons and escort ships that are protecting it. Now, individually, we also have some systems of, of, of security that all, we all have access to. We have all kinds of insurance and, and financial and medical and government services. And in Texas, we have guns and ammunition. And, 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 and all these things provide us with different types and levels of protection. Right? It depends on how much you want to spend. You will get you know, protection. And while all these things are good and necessary for all Americans, none of these frail and temporal places and things can offer the spiritual and the physical protection that our almighty and sovereign God offers to his children. Furthermore, God's divine protection is only available to those who have trusted in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. The psalmist then continues in verse 3, emphasizing the Lord's work by saying that it is he, meaning the Lord, who delivers you from the snare of the trapper and from the deadly pestilence. Here the psalmist likens the snare of the trapper and the deadly pestilence with all the danger and the adversity perpetrated by evil people. And something we know, and we need to remember, is that this world system in which we live is governed by Satan, who, as I said, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. And unfortunately, Christians are prime targets for his attacks. 
And these attacks will most likely be conducted through other people, through evil people by means of word and deed. And this could be false accusation to the, uh, accusations to destroy your reputation, or perhaps words or actions that are meant to bring pain and discouragement to your life. It could also be through physical attacks in order to cause you physical pain and emotional harm, or it could even be physical death. And these are just to name a few. Now, deadly pestilence could very well refer to disease like the COVID pandemic that we just had or, or any other disease that you can think of that is threatening the world. However, I think that it may actually refer to sin and doctrinal error. We know that even after salvation, all believers, all of us, continue to deal with sin and its damaging effects. Believers, of course, are not exempt from falling into sin. We are not exempt from being fooled into believing false doctrines. That's something that we really need to pay attention. We are not exempt. We're not immune to being fooled into believing false doctrines. I also want you to notice how the author of this psalm does not say that we will never fall into the snare of the trapper or a deadly pestilence. What the psalmist does say is that the Lord will deliver us. He will deliver us from it. So are you facing any trials right now? I mean, think about it. I don't think there's any one of us here that is not facing a difficulty, whatever that may be, right now. We as believers may have to face different kinds of evil, but in every trial, in every difficult and painful circumstance, you need to know that the Lord will be there giving us the faith, the strength, and the confidence we need to go through those hardships. The author continues with the imagery of the fowler's snare and the refuge and fortress in verse 4, where he wrote, He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you may seek refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a bulwark. This verse reminds us of Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 11, that says, Like an eagle that stirs up its nest, that hovers over its young, he spread his wings and caught them. He carried them on his pinions. Pinions are wings. Like Moses in Deuteronomy and the, now the psalmist compares God's divine protection with that of a bird who tenderly covers its cheeks with its wings in order to protect them from harm. So the message that the psalmist is conveying here is that the Lord offers safety and comfort for his children. There is nothing that can hurt or terrorize those who find themselves under God's wings, those who are under God's protection. Because just like a bird protects its cheeks, so will the Lord protect the souls of those who belong to him. A contemporary and perhaps graphic illustration, graphic in a good way, of this message of safety and comfort can be clearly seen in the logo of NORAD that I was just talking about. Um, their logo is the world that is covered by a couple of wings. And then in the center, there is a sword covering all of North America. And the wings in this uh, logo, the wings represent NORAD's protection over the Canada and the United States. And the sword rep represents our ability to strike the enemy. And that same thing can be said about the Lord. God protects his people, and he is more than capable and powerful to strike any of his enemies. So what we have seen so far in this psalm is that God is faithful to protect and to provide for his children. God is like a fortress who protects, protects all those who are in him. He is like a shield, like an impenetrable wall who protects us from the attacks of our enemies. This is not the iron wall that crumbled, that failed. This is God's wall. God has promised 
to never abandon his children, especially in times of need. And as a result of this, the psalmist says in verses 5 through 8, you will not be afraid of the terror by night or of the arrow that flies by day, of the pestilence that stalks in darkness or of the destruction that lays waste at noon. A thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right, right hand, but, you sh but it shall not approach you. You will only look on with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. As I mentioned at the beginning, we are permanently surrounded by danger. And for some reason, many of us become fully aware of these dangers right in the middle of the night when you're asleep. Perhaps like me, you have woken up at two or three in the morning worried about your children, your spouse, your family, your business, your job, your school, your house, your friends, you name it. There's a, there's a ton of things to be worried about every day. Others may be concerned about their health, may be worried about the time and the place for the next pandemic. Perhaps you worry about our country or the economy. Maybe you worry about the war. You know, the war in Israel is threatening to spill through the Middle East and perhaps the world, or that's what the news say. And, and there's every reason to be concerned about that. And most likely, today, and for the next few days, you would worry about politics. In just two days, we have a major decision to make. Who will be the leader of the free world in the next four years? Now I need to say something really quick about this. And what I want to say is that your vote, our vote, matters more than we can imagine. All the names that are written in these ballots not only represent a person, they also represent a platform. They represent a vision for this country and a vision for our lifestyle. And people and their personalities, you need to know, People and their personalities, they come and go. They have a limited time on this earth. Unfortunately, their policy decisions can remain for a very long time. Therefore, it is essential that we choose the platform that best honors the Lord, the platform that upholds Christian values by opposing lawlessness, opposing death and evil, and instead promotes life, freedom, law, and order. So if you haven't already voted, as I'm sure many of you have, make sure you show up on Tuesday and cast your vote. Now, back on our text, regardless of the source of our worries, when these thoughts enter our minds, we must remind ourselves, if you belong to the Lord, you have nothing to fear. As believers in Jesus Christ, our security is not on the quantity or the quality of our possessions. Our security is not in our jobs or in education. It is not on our intellectual abilities, on our physical strength. Our hope is not in politicians, scientists, in intellectuals, innovators, or influencers. Our hope and security is solely in the Lord Jesus Christ and his work on the cross on our behalf. And the Lord Jesus promised to be with us always, even to the end of the age. Now, let me give you a couple of real life illustrations that I believe capture what the Psalm is just described in verses five through eight. The first case is about a young couple of unbelievers who got married 10 years ago, probably 11. I will call them Arthur and Sophia. And then when Arthur and Sophia first got married, both of them had very well-paying jobs. They had a nice house in a nice neighborhood. They had nice clothes, nice vehicles. You get the picture, okay? And they appeared to live a comfortable and happy life. And then five years into their marriage, things got even better, and they happily welcomed their first baby. So life was good. These guys had everything that you could ask. But then the pandemic came, and while neither of them lost their job, they did have to transition to work from home. 
And unfortunately for them, the confinement was too much, specifically for Arthur. As soon as the pandemic was officially declared to be over, Arthur unexpectedly served his wife with divorce papers. Stunned, saddened, desperate, Sophia demanded an explanation. What, what did I do? What, what can I do to make you stay? Is there someone else? I mean, I don't understand this. What made you take this drastic decision? Why am I just hearing about this? Why are you leaving me? Why are you leaving our son? Why are you destroying our life together? The answer was brief and very simple. He said, I cannot take it anymore. I need to leave. And he did. In Arthur's mind, divorce was in the best interest of his young family. And just like that, this man abandoned his wife and his baby. As you can imagine, Sophia was left betrayed, heartbroken, and alone, facing an uncertain, difficult future where she would have to raise and provide for her baby, most likely by herself. Arthur is the tragic picture of a man with no God, no faith, and no hope. Arthur saw the world burning around him, and he was overwhelmed by doubt and paralyzed by fear. Arthur sank into the darkness of his fears and drowned in his despair. He felt alone, unprotected, incapable of leading, providing, and protecting his family into the future. And rather than turning to God, Arthur trusted in himself, and he unilaterally and selfishly determined that abandoning his wife and his baby, that fleeing from his responsibility to them was the best way to protect himself from the uncertainty of the future. Now, in contrast, I'm going to offer you a happy example of my friend David. David has an upper management job at a global corporation here in the US. And as many as you know, many of you know, these types of jobs pay very well, but they do require much of your time. So whenever David was not traveling for work, he would normally have to leave around 7 or 7.30 in the morning, and he would not come back home until around 7 or 8 at night. Now, you need to know that David is not a workaholic, okay? He is not interested in climbing the corporate ladder or in amassing riches. That's not David. David's only purpose in work is to honor God by providing for his family, by contributing to the cause of Christ, and helping others who are in need. That's who David is. He is truly a man of God. Now, this same pandemic that brought panic and uncertainty to many, like Arthur, also brought a huge blessing to others like my friend David. The transition from working from the office to the home meant that David would no longer have to travel and be away from home two or three days a week. It meant that he didn't have to leave for 12, 13 hours every week. The confinement allowed David to do things that he did not get to do often. David got to be there with their kids when they woke up. He got to eat three meals at home with his family. He got to go on walks with them around the neighborhood. He, got spend, he, he spent time with his wife and his children in between meetings. He was there to put them to bed. The pandemic gave David the opportunity to enjoy time with his beloved family. Now, of course, this time was not without its challenges for David. Like many other corporations during the pandemic, David's company made all kinds of demands and dispensed all types of ultimatums. For many months, David's continuation at his job was in doubt. This, this, these threats, these ultimatums were not empty threats. In fact, many of David's co-workers were actually laid off, were fired for failing to meet the company's demands. And like Arthur, David could also see the world burning around him. 
David was also facing the very difficult challenges that threatened his livelihood and the well-being of his family. David did have problems. David was facing challenges. For David, disaster was just one email away. You are fired. But unlike Arthur, the situation became, when the situation became darker and darker, David tucked himself deeper and deeper inside the wings of God, as our psalm says. David was not crushed by the pressure of his employer. David did not fall apart. He was not overwhelmed by dark and unholy thoughts. Instead, David clung to God's promises. David trusted in the Lord and drew nearer to him through the reading of his word, through prayer and fellowship with other saints. David knew that even in the midst of the darkest dark, God is sovereign over everything and he protects and provides for his children. That's what David was counting on. And throughout all this time, David, uh, God clearly, unequivocally, and repeatedly demonstrated to David and his family that those who trust in him will not be disappointed. God did not only provide abundantly for David and his family during these difficult times, God also used David to bless other people in need during these difficult times. These anecdotes remind us of the Passover in Exodus chapter 12, where those who, like Arthur, were not covered by the blood of the Lamb, those who were not children of God, experienced unimaginable terror, unimaginable and painful loss. And those who, like my friend David, trusted in Christ for their salvation and have been adopted into God's family, have absolutely nothing to fear because it is God himself who watches over them at all times. As a matter of fact, that is the assurance that the psalmist gives to those who dwell in God in verse 9. For you have made the Lord, my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. Here the psalmist not only declares his faith and trust in God, he also encourages his readers, us, to do the same. Why? Because those who dwell in the Lord, those who believe in Christ for their salvation, are once and forever forgiven from their sins and freed from God's judgment and wrath. Because those who belong to Christ are not only forgiven and saved forever, they're also adopted into God's household. And therefore, they are forever under God's protection. In verses 10 through 13, the psalmist describes this protection. He wrote in verse 10, No evil will befall you, nor will any plague come near your tent. Here the psalmist tells us that evil cannot touch us or come near us because God is always standing between his children and every evil and violent assault from the enemy. It is God who protects us from being overwhelmed Again, this brings us back to Exodus chapter 12, where only those who belong to God, only those who were under the Lord's protection, were spared from the pain, the terror, and the death that was brought by the, 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 the plagues that God had unleashed on Egypt. In verse 11, the psalmist states the reason why no evil can come near us. He wrote, For he will give his angels charge concerning you to guard you in all your ways. Angels are ministering spirits who sometimes appear in bodily form. We see that in Scripture. Angels have two primary um, purposes. One is to worship God, and the other is to serve God. So in the Scriptures, we can see that as servants of God, angels perform seven, tasks, seven, uh, seven different tasks. They deliver messages for God. They protect and lead nations. They carry out God's judgments, act as God's witnesses. They act as angels, agents to answer prayer. They serve those who will inherit salvation. And as the psalmist says here, they protect believers. God has commanded his angels to watch over us, to watch over his children at all times. And here, 
what I want to point out is how the noun angels is in plural, meaning that contrary to popular belief, God does not assign one single angel per child of God. He doesn't assign, assign just your one guardian angel. He assigned numerous angels to watch over every single believer. And this again is further proof of God's abundant and general provision for those who belong to him. It's not one angel, it's many. An example of this angelic protection can be seen in 2 Kings chapter 6, where Elisha's servant realizes that an army with horses and chariots, a powerful army, has surrounded the city. So the servant comes to Elisha in panic, and he said, Alas, my master, what shall we do? They're going to kill us. We are surrounded. So Elisha answered, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Then Elisha prayed and said, Oh, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. The point here is that those who belong to the Lord are never alone. They are never vulnerable to evil. Those of us who belong to God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ are never too far. We are never hidden from God and his angels. The psalmist tells us here that angels are around us wherever we are, whether we see them or not, they are watching they are listening, and they are ready to assist God's people. In verse 12, the psalmist tells us that angels not only are on alert to come to our aid in case of, uh, the, that any evil befalls us, they're also preventing us from stumbling in our path. The psalmist said, they will bear you up in their hands that you do not strike your foot against the stone. In this figure of speech, the phrase, bear you up in their hands, conveys the idea of protecting or taking care of someone. In addition, the phrase, strike your foot against a stone, represents all sorts of accidents and misfortunes. So think about a little baby when he or she is taking their first steps and how the father and the mother is walking you know, be behind them with their eyes and their arms wide open, making sure they stay on the safest spot, making sure they don't hit their heads on the corner of a table or take a rough tumble on the floor. This is the kind of protection and supervision that God has ordained for his children. And unfortunately, sometimes we behave just like children because we often pretend to know better and to see farther than our father. And what do we do? We take off. We depart from him. And sometimes God, sometimes God allows us to stumble and fall in order to show us our weakness, in order to show us our total dependency on him. And what I want you to know is that even in those awful moments of painful instruction, God is still bearing us up with his omnipotent hand. Even in the midst of that pain, God is still there with us. In verse 13, the psalmist continues with the same idea of divine protection, saying, you will tread upon the lion and cobra, the young lion and the serpent you will trample down. Here, all the animals represent every time of frightening danger or every uh, formidable trouble that threatens to destroy us. Some of these dangers are openly confrontational. They attack with great force and violence like the lion. Head on, you will see it coming. And others are astute and mysterious. They spring upon their victim insidiously and unexpected like the cobra. You know, you don't see it coming and all of a sudden, you, boom, you have the fang inside your, your calf. But regardless of their shrewdness or their strength, 
These dangers will be trampled over by the feet of the righteous. And it will be so because God promised to make his children victorious over all different types of evil that threaten us. Then in the last few verses of the psalm, it is the Lord himself who speaks and he makes three promises. God promises to deliver. He promises to answer prayer. And he promises to provide a long life. The first promise is found in verse 14 that says, Because he has loved me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him securely on high because he has known my name. Here the Lord is promising to deliver all those who have true faith in him. God promises to bring all believers into a secure and an accessible place. These divine promises are only those who know God, for those who have a deep and sincere love for God. Notice I said sincere love, not perfect love. God wants our sincerity. So God protects those who sincerely love him. And these are those who have a personal relationship with him through faith in Christ. This genuine an intimately, uh, intimate knowledge of God, this fellowship with the creator of the universe produces trust and confidence in him, especially in times of trouble and need. Verse 15, he will call upon my name and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. As many of you or us know full well being a believer does not guarantee an easy life. On the contrary, it seems like our, heart is, uh, our life is harder. Our faith in Jesus Christ does not exempt us from difficulty, pain, or suffering. In fact, all of us, as I was saying, at different times and in different measures, all of us experience different kinds of hardships and difficulties. Now, these trials, this pain, this suffering does not happen at random. They do not happen by mere chance. There is no such thing as luck. On the contrary, these trials are the result of God's will, and they are never, ever for a cruel motive. Instead, these challenges, these trials, this suffering serves a purpose in our lives, in the life of God's children. God uses these hardships and allow us to go through difficulty in order to sanctify us, to mature us in the faith, to make us more like his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, trials are never enjoyable. In fact, they're quite the opposite. Trials do produce distress. They produce physical and emotional pain and anguish. But our consolation our encouragement is that the Lord promised to answer our prayers. You see, when, when a believer is in trouble, he or she will be led to call upon the Lord through prayer. And here the Lord promises his children, when you do that, I will answer. I will answer your prayers. I will be with you in time of trouble. Trials and difficulty do not signify that God has abandoned you. It does not mean that he has forgotten you. God always knows what you are going through, and he is ready to deliver you because you belong to him. Remember, God honors those who honor him, and he always keeps his promises. Now, on the other hand, this does not mean that God is going to respond immediately after you finish your prayers. Most often than not, it seems to us that God takes a long time to respond. And you may be tempted to think that he's not listening. You may think that he does not care or that he truly has forgotten about you. But none of these things are true. These are temptations that come to your mind to deviate you from the Lord and from the fact that God actually does care for his children and he meets their needs at the appropriate moment, at the perfect time. God's timing, it's not like our timing. God's timing is 
perfect, and so are his will and his providence. God is never early. He is never late. God is always on time. Everything he does, he does it at the exact right time for our benefit and for his own glory. And sometimes this means we must wait. Therefore, we must be patient and trust that God knows what is best. And again, that he will keep his word. Finally, God promises to provide his children with a long life. He said in verse 16, with a long life, I will satisfy him and let him see my salvation. This phrase, I will satisfy, means that God will give his people life to the full. This satisfaction refers to a blessed life. To some, God may have given much. To others, God may have given little. Some may have had a long life. Some may have not. But the point here is that whether you had a long and prosperous life or a short and more modest life, you are satisfied with the life God gave you. And not only that, you are happy to leave this life behind when the time comes because you will finally experience the fullness of salvation. God's promises of satisfaction and salvation go far beyond our worldly existence. Our focus is not on this finite and imperfect world. Our focus and hope are set on eternity, in heaven, where everything is perfect in the presence of God. If you have trusted in Christ for your salvation, you are protected. You are safe. But if for any reason you are afraid of anything, whether it is your present circumstances or it's the future, you need to remember what Mr. Duncan said in his New Year's Eve message. Fear robs us unnecessarily of our joy. Let me rephrase that for you. Fear will rob you of your joy. Those of us who belong to Christ, we must remember God's promises. We need to do what Michael said a couple of weeks ago. We need to preach to ourselves. Preach these promises. Remember what God has said. We ought to trust that God loves us and that he will do as he said he would. I'm going to leave you with a word of encouragement from the Lord himself, who said in Isaiah 41, verse 10, Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And if you're here without Christ, you do have every reason to be afraid about the present, but most especially about the future. You stand guilty before the Lord. You are liable for all your sins. But there is hope even for you. Regardless of the magnitude and the quantity of your sins, all you need to do is believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. It is that simple. So let this day be the day of your salvation. Come to Christ so that you too may take refuge in the God Almighty for your comfort and safety. Well, with that, as Mr. Simmons says here, let's uh, stand and sing number 47 in the songs of praise, O oh, the love of my Redeemer. Father, we thank you for the time that we had reading from your word and learning from it. We ask you, Lord, that you would bless our country. The election time is coming. We do not know what's going to happen, but you do. So we ask you, Lord, that you would give us peace in our hearts to, this, uh, to accept whatever decision you make, knowing that our, uh, our future is assured in your hands. Lord, we thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ, who came to die on the cross for our sins. In his name we pray. Amen.